Amen. So what I'm going to talk about this morning really is so simple. It's something that you, if you've been here longer than three days, you already know it. Um, but simple truths I've found here. I may know them in my head. I may have some sort of knowledge of them, but it's not the hard knowledge. And I have found that the simple truths are the ones that demand really and truly the most of them. Um, I'll just give you an example. Simple obedience. As simple as that. Not very simple, right? Um, it demands something of you. It demands that you change so that you can be simply obedient. So what I want to talk about this morning is that simple truth that we need the body of Christ around us. We need people around us that are mentors, people that are spiritual covering, people that speak truth. And by that I really mean speak the Lord's truth from the Word of God into our lives. Sometimes when we don't want to hear it. That seems simple, right? Mm -hmm. Everybody that's been here knows that. I need the people around me. But the fact of the matter is human beings have a built-in forgetter. I know I do. I can't tell you how many times I have resolved to do something and I start off like gangbusters and slowly but surely over time I slip away from them. Is that true for you too? I'm going to give you a little proverb. Let me lay a little proverb on you this morning. Proverbs 13, 20. He who walks with the wise becomes wise. But he who walks with fools brings harm upon himself. Right? So he who walks with the wise becomes wise. And this is borne out biblically over and over and over again. So not only do we have a built-in forgetter, it's funny because Adam was talking about this yesterday. Um, it's funny, uh, honestly, we didn't talk about any of this, this stuff, but he was talking about the necessity of people around you and how we surround ourselves with people that are just like us. And one of the things that happens to us when we're out in the world is that we surround ourselves with people who think like we do. Who think like we do. All right? But there's a funny, funny fact of human nature, and psychological experiments over and over have borne this out. Not only do we have a built-in forgetter, forgetter, all right? But here's the other thing that we do. And it's not necessarily a bad thing, but it's a truth of humans, of fallen humans. You can put four humans in a row with a chair. Three of them are in on the experiment, but one of them's not. You can put a number on a board. Let's say you put the number two on a board. Three people are in on it, they go, it's a two, it's a two, it's a two. The person who's not in on it goes, it's a two. They put the number three up on a board. It's a three, it's a three, it's a three, it's a three. And then they start the experiment. Then they put a seven up there. And the three people that are in on it will go, it's a five. It's a five. It's a five. The person that's not in on it, you can see them. They look at everybody else, they look back at the board, they look back at everybody else who seems so confident that that's a five. They will say, that's a five. That's a five. That's a five. Because that's what we do. With enough people around us, we slowly but surely shape our own perception to match those. You know, that's that peer pressure your mother warned, warned you about when you were little, right? I mean, how many times? I got told this many times. If everybody jumped off of a cliff, would you jump off the cliff? Well, you probably would have. All right? But it is a fact of human nature. It's not necessarily a bad thing. It also is something that's built into us, born into us, because we are created like God. And we have the necessity and the desire for a relationship born into us. So this agreement that goes on where you will distrust your own eyes and agree with the people around you is not necessarily always a bad thing. If we didn't have it, we wouldn't have a spirit of cooperation. And the first thing you need to build any kind of society is a spirit of cooperation. Mm -hmm. If everybody's going off doing their own thing, nobody works together. 
We have to have the necessity for agreement built into us. But what happens to us is that good and godly thing becomes warped in us because the world gets a hold of it, right? And we get shaped to desires and beliefs that are not God, right? There's an example of this over and over in the Bible. So mainly I'm going to use two passages. You should know them well by now. The first one is in 1 Kings. And it's 1 Kings 18, 20. So while you're finding that, I'm going to tell you the second one is what I taught on last Friday. And it's in Luke 24. And it's the road to Emmaus. So why don't you find both of those? Luke 18, Luke 24, and then 1 Kings 18, 19. This is how quickly we become in agreement with voices around us that necessarily aren't good for us, even though we may start out with great resolve. This is why we need good, godly counsel around us. We need people to challenge us like they do here. Like they do here. Alright? So what happens in 1 Kings 18 is the very familiar, I hope by now, story of Elijah at Mount Carmel. Y'all should know this. This is when Elijah the prophet brings fire down on the prophets of Baal. Right? So basically Elijah has said to King Ahab, who is wicked, I want you to gather all the people of Israel on Mount Carmel because you guys are living in sin again and you are worshiping foreign gods. I want you to bring all those priests and those foreign idols and gods up there, get all the people there. We're going to have a who is the real God showdown up on this mountain. Okay? Now, if you've read the Old Testament at all, if you've read the New Testament, this is the repetition of a cycle that happens over and over again. The children of Israel together go astray. They, after great resolve, oh Lord, we'll worship you, you're the only God that we have, they slowly but surely together drift off. Then a voice comes, a corrective voice, calls them to repentance and they repent Again, but then they drift off again. Okay? I'm going to show you an example of this. So what happens is, Elijah's up there, and before he calls the fire down, he addresses the people of Israel. And this is what I want to go to. So Ahab, that's the king, the wicked, wicked king, the sinful king, summoned all the Israelites and gathered the prophets in Mount Carmel. Then Elijah approached all the people and said, How long will you hesitate between two opinions? If Yahweh is God, follow him. But if Baal, follow him. But the people didn't say a word. Alright. So let me clarify what the translation here for opinion is. This is just not a lightly tossed off opinion. This word is a strong, strong word. It means how long are you going to sit here and have two contradictory beliefs in your life staring in your face? It is time to make a choice. But the people didn't say a word. They were following idols. And these, for us, this does not mean necessarily these golden idols that you make. This is anything that you put before God in your life. I don't know about you, but I sure was worshiping idols before I got here. I was worshiping at the altar of drug addiction. I was worshiping at the altar of the world. I was worshiping at the altar of success. Those were all our of relationship. These were all the things that I put in front of God. Put in front of God so much that I basically forgot about him. Didn't hear him anymore. But I had a whole group of people around me that were doing it too. That said, yeah, sure, yeah, sure, yeah, sure, yeah, sure, yeah, sure. I imagine that when Elijah is saying this to the Israelites and they don't say a word, what do you think they're all doing? I think they're all looking around at each other. They're like, oh, no, they don't say anything. You don't say anything. You don't say something. <laughs> no, let's just sit here. Yeah. Yeah. 
I'm just gonna sit here. Yep, not gonna say a word. I'm not, I'm not gonna say a word. I'm going to stay deluded. I'm going, not going to take an action that gets me out of this. They have no good God counsel around them. They have surrounded themselves with people that buy into and mirror their beliefs. That's a comfortable way to live, isn't it? It's not so comfortable to live as a believer. Sorry, but it's not. It's a beautiful way to live. But one thing's going to happen, the Word of God will be spoken to you, and it will jolt you out of the beliefs you have. That's how you change, y'all. If you think that you're going to sit around, we're going to sit around, we're going to become believers by keeping our own little thoughts spinning around in our head. We're not. We need good, godly counsel. We need to walk with the wise. How do your ears open up? By ears opening up, by hearing the Word of God. You hear the Word of God, it starts to open you up. You sit under the Word of God, it starts to open you up. It starts to do things. Now, you can actively run away from it. Absolutely, you can. And plenty of people do. But the point is, if you surround yourself, it's just like the old saying, you go to a barber shop long enough, you're going to get your hair cut. Right? That works in the kingdom of God, too. You come to this barber shop long enough, you're going to take an action. You're going to do something. You're going to do something because the Word of God is much more powerful than the world. The world is seductive. It will seduce you. If you get people around you that are seducing you, you're going to be seduced just yeah. like the Israelites. But you get the right people around you like Elijah that are going to jolt this world. They're going to call you out on this world with love. They're going to challenge your world. That's why we're all at different points here. You know, you ever wonder why this getting set up like school set up where everybody graduates and then everybody starts at the same time and then that class goes, right? Doesn't do that. We all come in at different times. We all learn at different times. We all have authority. We learn here to live with the voice of wisdom around us in various forms. We usually don't like it. But I'm going to tell you something. I've seen this a couple of times and I love it because Jesus does the same thing. Jesus becomes that voice of wisdom. That if you are surrounded by that and you have people that are surrounded, it will speak into your life and it will slap clear you up. Go to Luke 24. The Emmaus disciples, the road to Emmaus, I talked Friday, there's tons and tons in it. But let me just remind you of a couple of things real quick. It is Resurrection Day. It is Resurrection Day. The women have gone to the tomb. The tomb is empty. The angel has said, why are you looking for the living among the dead? He's not here anymore. If you saw our Easter play, you saw the best Tennessee angel ever. Yeah. Amen. <laughs> Those women came to that tomb and what did he say? Yeah. He ain't here. <laughs> he ain't here. <laughs> it was fabulous. <laughs> Brought the whole house down. That is a Tennessee paraphrase. All right, and it was to the point. He ain't here. Well, he's not. It's resurrection. But they're all confused. They're human. They're talking to each other. They're feeding each other's doubt and unbelief. And these two guys are on the road to mess, and they're talking about what happened, and they're kind of getting into an argument. Do you think you, I don't know, I imagine they're saying, do you think you really rose from the dead? Well, I don't know. I don't know. I thought he was going to be the one that, you know, rescued Israel, you know? I don't know what he was. Well, I think he was. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. And Jesus calls them out. What are you two arguing about? You ever, does that ever happen to you in the worship hall? You're around the table, and you tick, 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 over here. I sure did it. And you're kind of talking low, and it looks like something. You're doing something, and you know you're kind of getting off in some areas that you probably shouldn't be talking about. Nobody's calling anybody on it. And from across the worship hall comes, what are y'all talking about over there? Well, that's what Jesus does, right? What are y'all talking about? And they said, well, you know, we're talking about all this stuff. We can't believe you don't know about it. We, you know, we thought he was going to rise, and some of our people saw him, and some of them didn't. And Jesus just said some truth. It's the best example for us. And it's the best Bible study ever. He sets them straight with the truth. He is the wise 
counsel, but he draws it from the Word of God. That's what wisdom is. That's what good godly wisdom is. He says to them, man, if y'all forgot, man, are y'all so, so slow to learn? Let's just go back through and settle this argument about who he was. Let's look at the word. Let's look at what the prophet said. He had to go through this. He had to suffer. He had to die. He had to resurrect. He had to be glorified in fulfillment of the scriptures. To give scripture after scripture after scripture. So that what happens is, from their voice of confusion, and if they kept on going down that road without Jesus, guess where they would have ended up? Probably worshiping some form of idol, a political idol, insurrection, the overthrow of Israel, the idol of doubt. All right? Because they're on their own way. They needed the wisdom. They needed the voice. They needed the teaching from the Word of God to address them. And then what happens to them? The Holy Spirit speaks to them through the words. And the words change them. And they say to each other, weren't we on fire? when he spoke to us. Didn't we see what he was saying? Because that's what good power and counsel around you is set up to do. It's set to check you. It's set to correct you. It's set to lead you to the truth. There are no, there's no room for people coming off under their, on a, under their own steam, right? Following their own drum flying solo in the kingdom of God. It is the most dangerous thing you can do. To have an idea, <laughs> bring it up with your counsel and not have it confirmed, and then go and do it anyway. It happens all the time, because yeah. that's what we do. We aren't, we aren't obedient, right? We worship our own point of view, right? And we're going to find people that agree with us. We're going to find people to agree with us. We are. We are. So that we're going to be sitting there looking at the truth, looking at the truth up on that blackboard, and three people next to us are going to go, that's not the truth. That's not the truth. That's not the truth. And we're going to say, that's not the truth. Or even worse, we're not going to say a thing. We're not going to say a thing. We're not going to say a thing until the fire from heaven comes in. I would rather be the fire that Jesus puts within me. I would rather make that choice to sometimes hear the hard thing, to get called out. What are you talking about? Let me set you right. What's going on in your head? Let me set you right. Okay. You might not like it, but boy, I need it. Thank you, Lord. So you surround yourselves with wisdom. You surround yourselves with wisdom and it helps you walk on the path. You surround yourself with fools, you're going to get in the way of form in the air. Amen? Amen. Amen. I'm not sure how encouraging that was, but there you go. Anyway, Susan M., will you pray? Crossville Mission is more than just a rehab. It's a refuge. Where desperate people bound by sin and addiction come to get radically set free. Jesus has set us free, indeed. And we want to tell everyone the good news that He will do it for them, too. So we bring a message of hope and freedom, evident in the testimonies of the precious lives here that Jesus has rescued from darkness. And we bring a message of healing and purpose evident in the stories of those who now give their lives to help rescue others.
We'd love to come and worship Jesus with you and share the truth that no one is beyond His love and grace.